right, we are so glad that you're here with us today at Avalon Church, and uh, our guest today is really not a guest. He's homegrown. He's one of us. Uh, Josh Gordy, everyone, welcome him to the stage here. Well, for those of you that may not know, Josh uh, played for several years in the NFL, and uh, he is from central Georgia and uh, moved uh, to McDonough uh, several years ago. How long ago did you move to McDonough? Hmm, was it 2015? 2015. Before look at, we look get started, wife, I assistance. forgot. Uh, <laughs> where is your wife? They moved. They moved. Right, right here in the middle, wife and family. Would you guys stand? Let's give them a hand. Uh, I know they probably don't want to be recognized, but we are so glad that you guys are here. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, I was teasing with you uh, earlier about uh, being a legend, a playground legend in third grade, and you corrected me. It wasn't until fourth grade that you started playing football. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your journey of, of how you started playing, uh, going through junior high, high school, and, and how you ended up uh, going to college. Oh, man. That's, that's a lot to unpack. Hopefully, I got a little minute. But, uh, but yeah, we were talking about that. You said third grade. I said, well, I didn't actually play football until fourth grade. Um, you know, funny story behind that, I was actually playing basketball first. I um, was playing for a recreation team, and end of the year, just didn't end up playing like I thought I would. So, like any kid, oh, man, I don't want to do that. So, I was like, well, let me try to play football. So, that's, that's where the football came in, into play. And, um, yeah, so I went over there, you know, started playing, liked it. Um, on through middle school um, and on into high school, and that's where – that's where a lot of time my story starts when I started, you know, speaking to crowds about um, life, le- life lessons and journeys through football. Um, <clears throat> and I like to relate it back to just being prepared, being pre- the preparedness when your opportunity arises, you know, it comes to come to play. Um, so in high school, if anybody is familiar with uh, anything sports related, football related on the high school level, people who make it to the next level, especially this level. You know, most people think about the guys who were the MVPs of their high school team and, you know, they had all the accolades from, you know, ninth grade up to their senior year. Uh, But that wasn't my story at all. Um, Midway through my senior year, uh, if anybody can put this into context, I was a special teams player on my high school football team. So does anybody, does that resonate with anybody, just what that means? So, and that, that's why I try to make that stand out. You know, people like, so you was only playing special teams midway through your senior season, and you end up making it to that level. You know, so that's, that's why I like to start that story. But, um, but yeah, about that eighth game of the season, um, you know, we had an injury, a small ankle sprain um, to, to a guy in the secondary. So when that happened, you know, our coaches were like, well, you know, we, we, we got this guy, you know, he's, he has great, he has good speed. That's, that's one thing I did always have good speed. So, like, well, let's try him back there, you know. And at that very moment, you know, something in my head was saying, ah, you don't know, because I, I didn't play the position. And, and I always look back, like, how my entire life would have been different if I would have just said, no, nah, I don't want to try that, you know. So, so talking to people, it's like, you know, you never know in that moment. Just take, just take a leap of faith, you know, and that would, and that's really what it took at that moment. Well, that, that tells me two things that I think are very important for people to hear. Number one, of being prepared when an opportunity comes your way. Right. But also your attitude. Here you were, special teams. You weren't necessarily thinking about getting to the NFL. Probably every kid that plays football think, dreams of that. But the fact is, uh, you had the right attitude when the coach asked you to do something that you were uncomfortable with, that you weren't familiar with, and you did your best. And I think that's very important, especially to our young people. Listen, if you have a job and it's not your dream job, do the best where you are. Because the fact is, if you do the best, then other opportunities are going to come. So anyway, yeah. uh, go ahead and continue. Yeah, with yeah you, you said a lot just then. Um, I mean, because at the time, look, I was, I was already, um, I was planning on going to Savannah State. A lot of my friends was going there. Um, Could have went to the military, Air Force. That was another option. I was in ROTC. So football, I mean, I was, I was going to finish it out. You know, I didn't want to quit, but I was pretty much ready to just do something different, you know, other than the NFL dream. I, I hung that up, you know, so that, that wasn't in the cars. 
Um, and, and, and like you said about no matter what you're doing, um, do it to the best because you never know. And, and just being even outside of the football world, um, you know, you see a lot of people getting opportunities just because of that great attitude. You never know. You know, you, you start out in a certain role in the company. You know, you you know, everybody used that example. I was in the mail room type thing, but it, it, it's, it's no different. That's what it is. You know, if you can commit yourself to doing that to the best of your abilities, like Martin Luther King said, I don't care what you're doing. If, if you're going to be doing your best, you be the best street sweeper they are, you know. Our church and COVID-19 uh, just kind of wrecked a lot of plans, and it has for some of you and a lot of you watching online. But the attitude that we have toward these things is extremely, extremely important for you to be able to go to another level or to be able to have success in, in whatever you do. So tell us a little bit about the rest of that season and the opportunity that came when you started playing in the secondary. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, I mean, something clicked. I, I can't, I can't say what it was. You know, I can't put my finger on it. Um, again, just having that faith, you know, you know, God, God given, um, you know, in, in that, I think it was six game span, you know, ended up with, um, uh, I think like 69 tackles, six interceptions, couple for, uh, turn for touchdowns. Um, and one of the biggest plays I had, which, which is a record that can never be broken. You know, they say records are meant to be broken, but this one can't because they tore the Georgia Dome down. So <laughs> that's why I can hold on to this one. Um, but in high school, I did have a 100-yard uh, interception return in the Georgia Dome um, against Cartersville. So I don't know if anybody's from Cartersville, but that's who it was against. Oh, they're horrible. Yeah. We don't care about them. I was like. <laughs> um, and so that was one of the biggest plays, and, and, and grabbed some attention from a local scout. I mean, not a local scout, but a college scout um, out of Central Michigan University, um, Joe Dana. Um, and, uh, and from there, that's where the scholarship offer came from. And so you ended up going to Central Michigan University. Uh, halfway through your senior year, you were only playing on special teams. You did what the coach asked. Obviously, God blessed you, but you worked. It wasn't like if you had not worked to learn the plays and to yep. be prepared, you would never have been in that. So tell us, once you got to college, uh, first of all, my question is, uh, you grew up in Georgia, <laughs> central Georgia, and uh, you are in central Michigan was the weather almost more than you could handle? That's my question. And um, I still don't know how I signed to this day. Um, again, maybe it was God given. That's why I met my wife at. So uh, <laughs> give it up. But man, I can remember on my recruiting trip, first plane ride ever for one, uh, for two, first time seeing real snow. And <laughs> they had just had a snowstorm. You know, but me being naive, you know, I was just thinking it was going to look like that all the time, you know. But as I learned, you know, they had just had a big snowstorm like the day before, you know. But uh, flew into Flint. Um, um, man, we flew in on this small plane. It was getting cold. It was coming in. We had to get off the plane. We didn't even have a, uh, what do they call it, tarmac? Yeah, tarmac, yeah, yeah. we didn't have that. We had to walk outside to get in the airport. It was crazy. And I'm like, man, I don't know how, how I ended up signing to that, but uh, ended up doing it. And you know what, backstory, you mentioned my brother Chris. So now Chris, he was, uh, he was like number two linebacker in the nation coming out of high school. So I remember he was getting recruited. Um, Auburn flew, it was Tub I think Tuberville, anyway. Flew a private plane down to Sandersville, Georgia to pick him up on his recruiting trip. So I'm thinking when I get my shot, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna have a plane come pick me up too. I'm just waiting, you know, waiting, but they end up emailing me a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> You know, finally right, went so to the what airport. you're saying is Central Michigan doesn't have the same budget as all the SEC football parallels. Yeah, so. unfortunately, you know, but we we working on it. We're going to get yeah. there. We're getting there. Well, so uh, tell us about a little bit about that career as well because uh, uh, you had an, another unusual opportunity uh, having been there that allowed a door to open for you to get to the NFL. Yeah, um, so getting to Central, I went in as a, as a safety um, and – that, after that year, for some reason, we had a lot of DBs, which were they were from the south, from Georgia. Um, they ended up leaving. Um, so Couldn't handle the snow. Yeah, they couldn't handle the cold, I guess. But uh, that ended up opening up doors again, you know. And, and so, again, I was asked to move to a different position from safety to corner. I had been learning safety all year, gaining weight, trying to get to that good size. It's like, hey, do you mind trying corner? I said, okay, well. And, again, 
being prepared. Because even as a safety, you got to learn what the rest of the secondary is doing. Um, and for any young players out there, you know, that's, that's what you can do to really give yourself an edge. Don't just learn your position. Learn multiple positions on the field. Uh, because once you make it to this level, the college level and this level, it's sometimes not about how good you are. It's about the more you can do. And we'll get to it later, but that's what kept me in the league so long, you know, being able to play multiple positions. Um, and shoot, even in business, in, in your company, the more you can do sometimes, that's what helps you stay around. Becomes more, you become much more valuable. Much more valuable. Um, to it. that because, of, once again, attitude, work ethic, these are all very, very important things. So uh, you're there at, uh, at your college. You get some opportunities because of some people that left or got injured. And then tell us yeah. ab about how that door opened for you for the NFL. Right. So I uh, ended up being a four-year starter up there. Learned, you know, learned a lot throughout the years. Learned the game even more. Uh, game slowed down, so that got better. Um, but by the time we left, we had ended up with one of the best teams in uh, Central's history. Um, largely in part to our quarterback, Dan LaFever at the time, and uh, great wide out, Tony O'Brown, uh, which everybody probably knows. Um, praying for him. <laughs> But um, uh, but yeah, so that that's really what started that I guess that project trajectory to the NFL. And again, I didn't know if I was gonna have a legit shot. But we had a pro day come up, and with those two guys being on the team, hey, they drew in 22 scouts. So 22 out of 32 teams, you know, that's a good uh, it's a good showing, you know, especially for a smaller school like us. Um, and um, what I was gonna say, so. Mental lapse sometimes, sorry. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, on pro day, you know, so had a good pro day. Uh, great 40, 4 3, 40. And that's what drew attention to the scouts. Uh, and that, that allowed me to get a little sliver, you know, into the, to the training camp and went to Jacksonville Jaguars at that point. Um, I want to share another story, too, about an opportunity. One of my teammates, um, he was like, man, I don't know. I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I'm going to participate. Because he didn't know, you know, none of us really knew if he was going to make it to the next level. I was like, man, what you got to lose? You know, you ain't, you ain't paying for it. Just go out there and try it. Um, long story short, he, he, he agreed to go try it. You know, just, just go out there and do it. Ended up playing 10 years in the NFL. Hmm. So, I mean, being prepared, right? The opportunity when it arises, yeah. taking it. Yep. So, um, let's kind of transition to your NFL career. Uh, you, were, you, you ended up uh, with uh, the Jaguars. We got a couple of helmets up here that people will find uh, very interesting. Um, you played for the Colts, and uh, you played for the Green Bay Packers, and that's where the Super Bowl ring came from. And um, so you also uh, played for, did you play for the Giants for a brief uh, period of time? Yeah, the Giants, uh, I see a jersey right there. <laughs> Who is that, is that uh, Roll or uh, O'Callaghan, man. I tell you what, I was up there when Landon came in. Uh, you don't see too many guys uh, who can come straight from college to the NFL day one ready. He was one of those guys. Um, I, I will give it to you on that one. So you got a good one on your back. Uh, good, good guy too. But um, so back to I guess first getting into the to the NFL. Jacksonville Jaguars one gave me my shot, um, and you go through the whole process, the whole off season, training camp, preseason game was released after the third preseason game, um, which that's the big cut. You know, you go down from 75 to 53 man roster, but it was a blessing in disguise. Um, so after I was cut from Jacksonville, I think I was home for three weeks and Green Bay uh, called me up to the, you know, to the actor, well, to the roster in Green Bay on practice squad. So, um, and that's where that journey started in 2010 with Green Bay, ended up making to the actor roster um, as well, played in a few games that year and went on to win the Super Bowl. So uh, you never know what pivot you may have taken in life. You know, just take it, take it on with, you know, the full confidence I'm going to do what I got to do, you know, to to make it make it to that next level. And, I mean, being on practice squad, if anybody, I know people know a practice squad, but hey, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of work. Well, show everybody your Super Bowl ring. Yes, sir. And – uh if you want to see that afterwards, uh, he'll be on the other side of this wall, and uh, you can go get a photo and look at this. Uh, got a trivia question for him, too. Got a trivia question. Trivia question. So 
If you do come out to the table and see it, if you got this answer, let me know. It's 109 diamonds in this ring. So if you can let me know what the significance of that number is. You're going to give them the ring. Uh. <laughs> Oh, I thought, I'm sorry, I thought that's where you were going with that, so. It did sound like I was going that way, but no. Oh, okay, okay, so. But, so in the year 2010, what was the significance of 109? 109 diamonds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Okay, that's a great question. And if I see you on your phone during my message, (laughs) I'm going to kick you out, all right? So, uh, but uh, let let me transition a little bit, because this is very important for people here. There's really two more things I want to talk about. One... Um, I know that, uh, like I said, you and your family were members here at Avalon, and um, I believe that you and I have talked about this, that your faith was very important to you. Um, how, what role did your faith play uh, during this whole process? Yeah. H- how did you handle that? Uh, what was your relationship with Christ like going from college into the NFL? Tell us a little bit about that. Man. Faith is number one, um, you know, the whole process, even in college. Um, you know, I, I actually attended church in college. A lot of people can't say that, but we, I was in there pretty much every Sunday. Um, and it's, I think it just came from such humbling beginnings, knowing that, um, you know, I never took it for granted. You know, I, I, again, I didn't think I was going to be that guy to keep stepping up and up. So when I did get those opportunities, I always made sure to, you know, say thanks to the one who made it possible uh, from the beginning. Um, and then even getting into the professional ranks, you know, your faith tested even more because uh, what a lot of people don't see, you see a lot of the big name guys, they stay with teams for 10 years, five years, whatever, but more role guys, like we, we able to, we're liable to switch teams every year. So in my six year career span, I was on five different teams. And so you can imagine the type of faith that takes all like, okay, here we go again. You know, move to another city. I got to pack up, move stuff here, take the family here. You know, but it's okay. I'm gonna keep the faith. This, this is what you got for me, God. And let's let's see, let's see where where it takes us. You know, going in the future, let's seize this opportunity again. Now, did you start? Did your family take you to church when you were a kid? Did you go to church as a child? Yep, grew up in the church, um, family church, Gordy Grove, down in, in Washington. So County. that was foundational in your life from the very beginning. Yep. Yeah, big, very big, very big. Um, yeah, the church is, man, it's been there for over 100 years. Now it's probably 110, I think. Uh, but The church down in central Georgia yep, where you attended. Yep, yeah. yep, so family church, family built it by hands. Um, it's just a, it's a prize staple in our, in our family and community. So uh, that's where it all started. Well, and, and I think this is very important for everyone here. If you have children, if you have grandchildren, bringing your kids to church is incredibly important, but I want you to hear what I'm saying. It's not the people that bring their kids to church that have such success with their children attending church afterwards and staying in their faith. I want you to hear what I'm saying. The statistics show those that serve in church. In other words, you don't just attend, but you're involved. Those that are involved, their children at about 10 times the rate of those who don't serve or are not involved but just come to church, Mm -hmm. their children stay connected uh, throughout their life. And what that tells us is that obviously you cannot, it's like the statement, you can't lead a horse to water. I mean, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. Well, obviously you can take your kids to church. You cannot make them have a relationship with Jesus Christ. However, you have a whole lot better shot of them having a relationship with Jesus Christ if you are authentic in your faith and they see that in you. And uh, so that is, uh, that is very, very important. So here's the last thing I want to, uh, the, the purpose of this is really helping us with our small groups because uh, we are kicking off small groups this week. And if you're not able to be in a group, I hope you'll try next semester to be in a group because it's, we do two semesters a year. It's very important. The, the most important part of it is the fellowship and so forth. But we also do interest-based uh, small groups. Uh, we have Cultivate for Women that's coming up. But one that I'm very excited about is uh, the Dave Ramsey uh, thing. And you are connected to that because you have been certified in that. You've taught that yeah. uh, several times. And uh, so 
here's what I want you to address, because a lot of people see a professional athlete, and they say, well, you know, they, they think things. I've learned that people, first of all, they think you make a whole lot more money than you do most of the time, <laughs> and they think you work a whole lot less than you do most of the time as well. Um, but one of the things I've always respected about you is that you were incredibly disciplined with your money. I think that says a lot about your family and about your upbringing. Um, but you and I have talked about this. Um, one of the things I hate most on television mm -hmm. is when you see these programs about professional athletes or singers or actors or whatever, and they're reveling in the fact that they went broke. They used to make lots of money, and now they're broke. Well, I despise that. Because first of all, it celebrates something that the Bible tells us not to celebrate. The Bible says that we are to rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. And so if you get a kick out of watching some professional athlete that wasted his money, but then put yourself in that position, because you and I talked about this. How many of you at 21 years of age could have handled suddenly having a million dollars or half a million dollars? Anybody here think you could do that? I know you probably would like to have tried it, uh, but the fact is I had a difficult enough time being 21 making $18,000 a year, much less, uh, you know, whatever. And so one of the things I, I want you to do is kind of talk a little bit about your view on that, uh, the discipline that it takes, and challenge some of our folks, because I think a lot of people want to, they want to take all their money and look like they got money rather than actually save or invest or, or manage their money well. So, so speak to that a little bit. Yeah, what's the, what's the famous saying? Um, you know, we spend money we don't have to impress people we don't know to, to buy things that we... What, can yeah, somebody it, help me out? To, to, uh, it, we spend money that we don't have to buy things that we don't need, need to, to impress, impress people, people we don't, don't even know. like. Yeah, and or don't know, period. Or yes. don't know, period. Yeah, you, yeah so... But, um, man, it's... There's so much in that, that we can unpack, but I guess starting with FPU, um, I've, yeah, to the, to the date, we, me and my wife, we've led seven of those classes. Uh, I think we would do one or two here. Um, so that was great. Love going through it. Um, but man, I was so glad when, when you, when you said, you know, we had that, when you made that, that statement about, you know, you're tired of seeing that. That's, that's been my, that's been my motto since day one, I feel like, you know, because there's so many guys out here that's doing it the right way. You know, of course, some you know some guys had their their uh, their run their mishap, mishaps or whatever. But there are plenty enough guys who've done it the right way that we can highlight. Yeah. And you know, make that known. And I always said, if I did a podcast, that's what I would do. I would bring all the pro athletes back who've who've made made the right decisions, right choices, and you know, and, and was able to live a you know live a comfortable life after after they were done. Um, Tell us a little bit about, uh, as you're speaking to that, yeah. um, when you were in the NFL, they offered classes, financial classes, every year, and you were one that, you were one of the ones that always would go uh, to those, showing that responsibility. Yeah, um, so it really it wasn't, a, it wasn't a choice. We had to go as rookies, um, but the disconnect with it was, we would have advisors come in, financial advisors, room like this, get up at the front, um, go through their whole spiel, you know, but I think the disconnect was, as a financial advisor, you only get paid by how much money you control, right? So that's what they always want to get to. How much money can you put in my control so I can put in your portfolio and they can make the most commission? You know, sorry to all the advisors out there, but that's just how the game goes. But what I think they should have, be done, should have done, and probably doing a better job of it today, I hope, um, going back to the base roots, you know, showing how to make that monthly budget, Throughout, you know, throughout the year, you know, live on, live on what you got to live on, set the rest to the side. Um, and I've, I've just never been a big, um, big knees guy, you know, so I, I know that played a part in, you know, being, being able to be disciplined. You know, you get into those, get into those locker rooms, you start seeing all this expensive stuff and yeah, people buying it, you know, but you look at it you're like, man, it's just a, I don't know, it's just another bag. You know, I can, get, <laughs> I can get the same bag. I can carry my clothes just as good as you can carry your clothes, you know. It, it just never, um, it never, never tickled my fancy to, to, to buy that type of stuff. Well, um, the Bible talks about uh, the fact that we need to have 
um, some contentment. Contentment, yep. And I think oftentimes what people find with finances especially is that they are not content. Not to suggest that we shouldn't uh, work for a raise or, uh, you know, enjoy the, the resources that God has given us. Not to suggest that even remotely. But the fact is, if you don't have contentment mm. and find that in Jesus Christ especially, it doesn't matter how much you, I mean, who cares if you pay I've seen the prices on some of the clothes and stuff, and it's just ridiculous. I, I looked at two. Uh, it, they looked identical to me. Mm-hmm. They were plaid shirts, okay? The red and black plaid, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. And um, uh, one of them was from a very fancy, fancy store that you probably wouldn't know the name of if I called it. And that shirt was $1,800 for a black and uh, red plaid shirt. The identical shirt, I could not tell the difference between them. And I looked online, I did this on purpose, to, I looked online at Walmart, was like $12, all right? <laughs> now, now, I'm not suggesting you need to buy all your clothes from Walmart. If, if you can if you want. But I'm saying that there is a contentment that can come yeah. from your relationship with God, understanding who you are in Jesus Christ, because most of the time I've found that people that are discontented with things is they're really discontented with who they are or who they perceive themselves to be, and they don't understand their value in the eyes of God. Yes. Um, man, contentment, that's one of the biggest words. If you're content with what you have, you don't have to worry about trying to, like you said, impress, get, get more stuff to impress. Because let me, let me tell you, it's just human nature. You know, you, oh, I want this next best thing. So you get it. Oh, now I want this. So you just keep going up and up. And it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, I don't know. It's some kind of, it's just a revolving door. You know, you right. never and, be content if, and if once that's again, all you're trying if, to if chase. If you make, if your net worth is $500 million, well, once again, I'm assuming you can afford to buy some of those things. And that's not going to put a strain on your budget. I doubt yeah. you're worried about paying your power bill if you have that much money. <laughs> right. uh, but the fact is, uh, Jesus himself said that life is not made up of the things that we possess, that our life is to be found in Jesus Christ and in giving our lives away. What does that mean to give your life away? Well, it means to invest it in others. It means to invest it in the kingdom of God. And those are the people that are the most contented people of all, no matter how much money you have, or whatever. And we hear all the cliches, you know, well, uh, riches, you know, can't buy you money. Well, that's true, but being poor, uh, riches can't buy you happiness. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, being poor can't buy you happiness either, okay? Mm-hmm. Our happiness is found not in our possessions, but in Jesus Christ. And so um, I think that is uh, incredibly, incredibly important. Do you have any last things you want to say to our people? And by the way, uh, one thing I wanted to ask. Tell us, if you don't mind, if you, you know if your wife will mind or not, okay? How did you guys meet? How did you guys meet? Tell us that. Um, I was on campus. She walked by, and she just couldn't uh, take her eyes off me. That, <laughs> I feel your pain, brother. <laughs> oh, I forgot we were I church. understand exactly how that feels. <laughs> I tell my wife all the time, I have to work really hard not to make all the women just lust after me every time I'm on stage. Oh, yeah. And I'm doing a pretty good job, aren't I? All right. You know, I don't think anybody has lusted after me in a very, very, very long time, especially if you see me with my shirt off. All right. So, but I digress. All right. So, I don't know how we went there, but tell us uh, yeah. how you guys met. Yeah. So, we, we, uh, just in college, we was in the same circle of friends. So, uh, she was there a year, a year before me, but I did. Like I, I knew her my whole college career. Uh, she wouldn't give me the time of day in college, but uh, we ended up reconnecting once we graduated. Uh, we, we was always good friends, close, so it, it was an easy connection to make. Um, she had moved to Georgia, so uh, tried to try it again, and it worked. So there we go. There we go. <laughs> she gave me the time of day. And you guys, uh, your children are six and eight. Six and eight. They. Uh, I wasn't cool enough for them to come out here and sit, so they. They're right, church, that, church. that's everybody. Everybody understands that his kids didn't want to sit in here. Like, no, we don't want to watch you on stage. You know, yeah. they wanted to go back to the kids program, which tells us how awesome the kids program is, by the way. And uh, you ought to be a part of it if you have your kids. So, yep, yep. 
But, um, well, I want to thank you for taking time uh, to share your story with us. And uh, just to summarize a, a couple of things, uh, you've got to have a good attitude. You need to work hard and be ready for when those opportunities come. Your exactly. faith is incredibly important. And handling your finances the right way, God's way, um, is incredibly important. No matter how much or how little you make, the principles are the same. And so, um, anyway, we are um, we're very, very, very glad. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Josh, for Thank you. being a part. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.